The Radical. Fundamental principles of freedom, rational self-interest, and individual rights. This is The Yaron Brook Show. All right, welcome everybody. Happy Saturday night. I hope you're having a great weekend. And uh, ready for the rest of the, for next week. Saturday night. All right. Um, I just got in. I'm uh, be traveling for three days straight. So we'll see if I can be coherent tonight. It's going to be a challenge. And um, I hope uh, I hope you guys, let's see, uh, YouTube, we're, we're going to be taking uh, Super Chat questions. So get ready. Those of you on Facebook, if you want to ask a question, move over to YouTube and prepare to pay up. Um, Let's see, what else do we want before we get started? Um, we're going to be releasing a talk I gave at UT, hopefully this coming week. Uh, it was on uh, free speech on the internet. It was a new talk, brand new talk, so uh, hopefully we'll have that up on um, YouTube in the next few days, and you could see that. I I'm not going to tell you what I did in LA because it's still a secret. I'm looking forward to disclosing the uh, secret in the weeks to come hopefully by the end of february we'll be able to uh, talk about it and you'll be able to see the actual results all right um what can i say alexandria just is a gift that keeps on giving she doesn't shut her mouth and as a consequence she continues to provide fantastic content for the iran book show and i have to admit that the fact that Nobody else has a clue how to respond to her. the fact that Fox News and the conservative media are so pathetic in the way they are addressing Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez uh, opens up an opportunity to actually have a, uh, for us to actually have a, a meaningful discussion about her. But um, I'd say that her and, uh, and Elizabeth Warren, Elizabeth Warren, who is now running officially, officially running for president, have basically spent this week declaring a war on billionaires. It is now open season on billionaires, and people are, people are excited to, uh, you know, to, to, I think, endorse and support and get behind these projects. So what I want to do a little bit today is talk about the two uh, talk about what uh cortez said uh we're going to watch the video of her statement about a society that produces billionaires and i want to talk about elizabeth Warren's uh new tax proposal and i want to give it all some historical context because i don't think this comes out of nowhere i don't think uh it's an accident that it's now and uh i, I think we have to understand in the context of what's happened in america over the last 10 years and uh, why I think these, these two women, um, AOC and, and Elizabeth Warren, are so, so, so dangerous. And uh, why I think the ideas are going to catch on. I, I don't think this is, a, this is just going to disappear. I think this is now going to be a central focus of the debate moving forward. So let's start with AOC. Let's start with her interview. Uh, this was in Martin Luther King's day, so last Monday. It was in an interview uh, that was done on stage. I haven't seen the whole interview. I'd like to see what else she said. I'm sure there's some other pearls of wisdom in there. Uh, she did an interview with uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates. Ta-Nehisi Coates is probably the most influential African-American um, intellectual in the United States today. He is an interesting guy and a, a very good writer, uh, even if you uh, dislike a lot of what he says. He is very mixed in terms of what he does say. But here he is asking uh, Cortez about billionaires. Oops, let's see. It is moral for individuals to, for instance, do we live in a moral world that allows for billionaires? Is that a moral outcome in and no, of itself? No, mm -hmm. it's not. Mm -hmm. um, it's not. And 
It's not, and Notice I think the crowd it's, it's important to say that. I, I, I don't think it's ne it, that necessarily means that all billionaires are immoral. It is right. not to say that someone like Bill Gates, for example, or Warren Buffett mm -hmm. are, are immoral people. I do not believe that. But I believe. Well, he kicks his dog. Right, like yeah, that, right? I, I, I don't, I don't, I'm yeah. not saying that. But I. Notice that, that morality, morality conventionally, is viewed as. You know, you're immoral if you kick your dog. You're immoral if you lie, steal, or cheat. You're immoral if you, uh, you know, hurt other people. That's the standard of immorality. Very different than the objective standard of immorality, which, you know, which places a huge, huge emphasis on what you do with your life and how productive you are with your life. So the attitude towards somebody like Bill Gates is, and, 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 uh, and, and Warren Buffett is so different not because they don't kick their dogs, but because of what they have done and what they have achieved and what they have produced in their lives. It's exactly the fact that they become billionaires, which is suggestive, not a proof, but suggestive of virtue. And to them, of course, it's meaningless. So let's, let's hear the rest. I, but I do, but notice how good she is on, on, on her feet. I mean, I'm sure this, this is not a rehearsed question. Um, She's good. She she gives the she gives the answer that her audience expects. The answer that I think she believes in. And she dist she makes sure not to make it a personal attack, particularly not on those very large billionaire um, Democratic donors, uh, but generally on, on on people that she might actually like because they're philanthropists and so on. Uh, but yeah, Warren Buffett and Bill Gates also happen to be good Democrats. But she's she's good, and now. This is, I mean, this is the highlight, right? I'm not saying that, but I do think a system that allows billionaires to exist mm. when there are parts of Alabama where, where people are still getting ringworm because mm -hmm. they don't have access to public health mm -hmm. is wrong. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's wrong that, uh, I, I think that it's wrong that that a vast majority of the country does not make a living rate wage. Mm -hmm. I think it's wrong that you can work 100 hours and not feed your kids. Mm -hmm. I think it's wrong that, uh, that corporations like Walmart can, and, and Amazon can get paid, they can get paid for the, by, our gov, by the government essentially experience a wealth transfer from the public for paying people less than a minimum wage. Mm -hmm. And it's, it not only doesn't make economic sense, but it doesn't make moral sense, mm -hmm. and it doesn't make societal sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we, we I have to tell you guys, she's good. She's dangerous. You got to watch her, and she's going to set the tone for the Democratic Party for the, for the next few years. And... If you think Republicans have an answer to that, they don't. Because what was the criticism on Fox News to what she said? Well, they made fun of the fact that she said that in Alabama people get ringworms. And, and one of the commentators said, well, what's a big deal about ringworms? I mean, people don't die of ringworms. Right? That's, that's the level of criticism. That's the level of discussion. And notice... Her critique of Walmart and Amazon is paying minimum wage, of not paying the so-called living wage. That, that's straight out of Tucker Carlson. She must have been listening to Fox News before she did this. Straight out of Tucker Carlson. So if you're, gonna, if you're going to be able to criticize what she has just said, if you're going to criticize Elizabeth Warren's proposal for wealth tax, which we're going to get to in a few minutes, you're going to have to do better than that. You're going to have to make a moral case for a system that allows for billionaires. Because her argument wasn't the billionaires are bad. She's not even saying the billionaires are thieves, although we'll get to her. One of her economic gurus actually did say I need to find that tweet, but did say that, um, that uh, billionaires are thieves. But she did not say that. She actually said, you know, they could be nice guys. 
But she said the system that allows them to exist, the system that makes it possible for them to exist, is an immoral system. It's an immoral system. And of course, she's proposing a 70% marginal income tax rate on all income above $10 million with an attempt to stop people from becoming billionaires and redistribute the wealth to those people who need it, to the people who are not surviving on a minimum wage and the people who, I guess, who get ringworms and the people who are poor and the people who are needy. So to actually combat her, to actually fight her views, you're going to have to be able to attack the welfare state. You're going to actually have to make the case that the welfare state, redistribution of wealth that she is proposing is immoral, is wrong. How many politicians are going to do that? So she wins. She wins. Because nobody is going to challenge her. Now, I'm going to do a series of stuff on uh, Cortez because I'm going, to, I'm going to take on her Medicare for All. I'm going to take on the uh, Green New Deal. We'll take every one of her proposals and analyze them. We'll do the same. We're also going to do the same with Elizabeth Warren because uh, Elizabeth Warren, too, has a whole series now of laws that she is proposing that she will enact if she becomes president. And I think they are all worthwhile discussing and analyzing and ultimately defeating and arguing against from a proper moral perspective. So what, what, let's get to Elizabeth Warren quickly, and then I want to give you some, some of the history and then some of, the, some of what I think of all these proposals. Elizabeth Warren is proposing a new wealth tax. Now, don't worry. Most of you, hopefully not all of you, but most of you will not have to pay it. But some Americans will have to pay it. Households that, make above, that have as wealth, not as income, as wealth, over $50 million will have to pay 1% of that. So $50 million, what is that? 10% is $5 million. 1% is $500,000. So I have to pay an extra $500,000 every year on that wealth. That'll be a wealth tax. And families, households, I guess, who have a wealth above $1 billion will have to pay 2%. Oh, sorry. No, no, I was wrong. 2% if it's over $50 million, 3% if it's over $1 billion. So if you got a billion dollars, right, 3% is what? $30 million. You're going to have to pay every year $30 million. Did I get that right? $1 billion. $100 million is 10%. Yeah, $30 billion. $30 million is taxes. Um, and according to articles I read, two-thirds of Americans think that higher taxes on the wealthy is a good idea. So all... AOC is doing and, what, and Elizabeth Warren is doing are proposing things that have very popular support. And note that if it's two-thirds, that's, there's a significant number of Republicans. And I wouldn't be surprised the significant number of Trump supporters who think that this is a good idea. Now, again, I, I think about the attacks on this that I've seen. So uh, in this particular article, uh, they propose three things why this is really, really a bad idea. Why is it a bad idea to have a wealth tax, an annual wealth tax, that taxes wealth every single year on wealth over 50 million and then wealth over a billion? Well, they say, first, wealth is a squishy thing. It's hard to measure. It's not clear what it's worth exactly. What is the Renoir painting above the fireplace actually worth? When was the last auction of Renoir paintings? How do we assess it? How do we know? So it's just hard to implement a wealth tax because wealth is squishy. It's, it's, it's very difficult to calculate, right? There's a principled objection. And then the second was, well, it's, it's, it's and I've heard this from a number of people on the right, it's not clear it's constitutional 
to do it, you would, there's something about how you would have to do it across different states and some states that didn't have billionaires, it would be difficult. Anyway, it's not constitutional, maybe, right? And we could pass a constitutional amendment, we can fix that. We did it with the, with the income tax, so we can fix that. And again, not exactly principled. And the third, which I think is the best, right? The third is the best objection. It says, look, yeah, it's going to raise a lot of money. Uh, uh, by some estimates, the wealth tax would raise $2.75 trillion now, over 10 years. Now, that assumes that the wealth is static. That assumes that the wealth can be hidden. That assumes a lot of things. Okay, but let's go with it. $2.75 trillion, which means about $275 billion a year, which is not to sneeze at. That's a real number. That's a lot of money, even by Washington, D.C. standards. Wouldn't close the deficit, which is over a trillion dollars now, or, or is a trillion dollars now. But, you know, it's, it's something, and, and I'm, I'm going to do a show soon on, on modern monetary theory, which basically said deficits don't matter, and so who cares, right? $275 billion a year. But they say the problem is that it won't go to poor people. The problem is that Congress is just going to spend it on its pet project, bridges to nowhere, or whatever, and it's not going to go to the people who actually need it. Right? And the same article criticizes AOC's proposal that of raising the top marginal income tax rate from 37.6 to 70%. And what's the critique? The critique is it's far too ambitious. <laughs> this is the state of the critique of these, uh, these proposals. Sad. It's sad. Right? Nobody, nobody will actually defend billionaires. Now, we've seen this, and we've seen it now for 10 years, I'd say. The financial crisis was really a pivot point. I think ultimately will be remembered by historians as a pivot point in the history of American capitalism, the point in which America, to a large extent, turned against capitalism, turned against economic freedom. If you remember, everybody, left, right, center, blamed the financial crisis on capitalism, on too much freedom, on bankers, on greed. And the solution was to bail out the banks, to get government more involved in the economy, to get government more involved in finance, in order to save capitalism from the capitalist, George W. Bush told us, we have to increase the size of government, we have to bail out banks, we have to massively intervene, I mean massively intervene, what the Federal Reserve did and what the Treasury Department did in those dark days of, uh, of uh, late summer and suddenly the fall of 2008 is some of the most massive interventions, maybe the most massive interventions in the U.S. economy that we have ever seen. And all of this to save capitalism. Of course, the direct consequence of that was the Occupy Wall Street movement, which was massive, active, and at the end of the day, had no serious opposition. That's where the term, the 1%, which is now common language among us, that's where the 1%, uh, that term, came into our vocabulary. And again, there was no moral opposition to Occupy Wall Street. I mean, they were made fun of, and yeah, these kids, these hippie kids on their iPhones complaining about billionaires. But it was at that level. It was at the ringworm level. It was the level that AOC is being criticized. There was no actual moral challenge. And there was, certainly was no defense of billionaires, no defense of capitalism. In the end, quite the contrary. What came out of Occupy Wall Street, what came out of the financial crisis, was a new intellectual focus for many on the left, and I think embraced by many on the right. And that is a focus on inequality. And I have to tell you, I saw this 
early on. And I remember, because I, 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 I knew this was going to be a big deal, that the left was going to use the whole issue of inequality to make proposals exactly like we're seeing right now, to, 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 to save, I mean, Elizabeth Warren, by the way, is doing all this under the guise of saving capitalism. She, be, she says she believes in capitalism. And I went, I remember I went to, to Don Watkins and I said, this is the issue. This is it. This is what we have to write about. And that is the origins of the book, which you should all be reading and hopefully all have read. And if you haven't read, you should read because it is the book that actually presents the argument that to counter AOC and to counter Elizabeth Warren and to counter the whole inequality brigade, army, and as the book Equal is Unfair. So Equal is Unfair, it's available on Amazon, it's available on Kindle, it's available on, you know, Apple Books, it's available everywhere. And, and uh, if you haven't read it, you should read it. It's available on audiobooks. Equal is Unfair, an easy name to remember. Uh, every intellectual in America, every, every public intellectual, certainly all the economists, came out with dire predictions about the effects of inequality in American life. Lots of economists came out with studies showing that economic inequality was destroying America. The economic inequality was actually keeping poor people poor. That economic inequality was making the lives of the middle class miserable. That economic inequality was holding back the lower middle class. Thomas Piketty the French economist, became a worldwide celebrity. I mean, when he flies anyway, he gets presidents coming out to meet him. He gets red carpet treatment. He is the most famous economist in the world today for writing Das Kapital for the 21st century. No, I, I'm sorry. You wrote, you wrote Capital for the 21st century. Just It's Das Kapital in German. Um, you know, it's an insult. To, to, to Marx to, uh, to claim that this guy is, a, is, is wrote a follow-up to Das Kapital by Marx because Das Kapital was a philosophical work, wrong in every dimension. But Das Kapital was much more philosophical than economic and it wasn't a, a, just a barrage of data and empirical studies and, and, and just ridiculous claims. There was a real attempt to actually present an argument that Karl Marx made. Again, flawed and wrong and immoral as it was. Thomas Piketty's book is nothing. It's just numbers with wild interpretations and even the numbers people have shown post book are flawed, are sometimes made up, or at least, what do they call it in postmodernism? Uh, deconstructed. How about that? Deconstructed. The numbers are deconstructed. And it's philosophical arguments are just arbitrary. There's no argument made. Even his economic arguments are arbitrary. There's no theory presented. There's no real argument made for why he thinks the things that he thinks. But he established, according to his many, many fans, including on the right, many fans on the right who claimed he should get the Nobel Prize for economics on this, and he will probably in 10 years. They all admired the data and his use of the data. And they all recognized that there was a real problem here. A real problem that inequality was growing and this was bad. And everybody was talking about this. And everybody continued to talk about it. And continued to talk about how middle America, those miserable middle America who work hard every day and can't make a living and can't succeed and can't advance, and wages have been stuck for 20 or 30 years, and standard of living has not moved at all, and life sucks generally, and can't we all go back to the 1970s where life was amazing for middle-class Americans? And only the rich got richer, and nobody else gets richer. Nobody else gets richer. Only the rich. Only the billionaires. Everybody else got poorer from the 1970s till today, or at least stayed stagnant. And the people who created this system, this capitalism, the people in power, they are evil, they are bad. 
Everybody agreed, again, left, right, center. They had different remedies to how to fix it. The right says, oh, what we need is more free market because inequality is a real problem. What we need, we, the way to solve it is more economic freedom. And the left said, no, 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 no. The way to solve economic inequality is more redistribution of wealth. But the fact that it was a problem, everybody acknowledged. And the fact, the fact that somehow the middle class in America, particularly the, the, the blue collar middle class in America, had been screwed for 30 to 40 years, that was undisputed. That was undisputed. And screwed by whom? Well, by the billionaires, by Amazon, by Walmart. And by the Chinese, of course, by trade. And I think the first consequence we got from that whole intellectual movement, that whole, I think, Occupy Wall Street, and then the support it got academically, intellectually, from, from the economics profession, but then from the public intellectuals more broadly, and ultimately from, from, you know, ultimately from politicians and from the media. The first consequence, the first real consequence for America that we got from that is Donald Trump. Is Donald Trump. Because Donald Trump did not appeal to free market capitalism. He did not appeal to an economic system that produces billionaires. He did not appeal to an economic system that is about growth and about freedom and about innovation and about progress. No. Donald Trump's whole shtick was to identify with the middle class that felt that they had stagnated. Their whole shtick was to tell them, you're right, you have been screwed. You've been screwed by the Chinese, you've been screwed by the elites, you've been screwed by the billionaires, you've been screwed by the Mexicans, you've been screwed by all these people. You're absolutely right to be angry and I'm going to fix it. I'm going to fix it. Somebody says, there you go again, Donald Trump. What can I do? He became president. If he hadn't become president, I'd never mention his name. But he's in the middle of any story, any story that's going to tell the, 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 what happened in, the, in, in, in this part of the 21st century is going to include Donald Trump as a symptom of a much wider phenomenon. And I think the first real consequence beyond Barack Obama's presidency, the real long-term consequence, the real damaging long-term consequence of the misdiagnosis of the financial crisis and the adoption of the idea of inequality as a real problem, the adoption of the idea that the middle class has stagnated the first real consequence is the election of Donald Trump. I think the second big political consequence is the rise and the, 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 um, the adoption of moral confidence by the progressive or regressive left, by not just the, the identity politics, the, 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 the crap that goes on on campuses, the the kind of left that, that complains about gender and about race and all of that. But now, the socialist left, the statist left, the left that in economic policy wants to regulate control and tax capitalism to death, they have become emboldened. They have become stronger. They have become popular. And now there's no real disagreement between them and many on the right. Take again Tucker Carlson, who just expresses vicious hatred for people like Jeff Bezos, hatred for companies like Walmart, hatred for the idea of billionaires. The failure to defend capitalism, the failure to identify what capitalism is in 2008, the failure to morally condemn the Occupy Wall Street movement, the failure to morally condemn and factually condemn the inequality fanatics, the inequality purveyors of fear, 
has led not only to the disaster that is the Trump presidency, but is ultimately going to lead us. It's going to lead us to Elizabeth Warren. Or to some future nutty, crazy leftist presidency. And there's no opposition, no real opposition, just as there was no opposition to the idea that capitalism caused the 2008 Great Recession. So what would we have had to say back then? What would we have to say today if we are going to defend ourselves against AOC, if we're going to defend ourselves against Elizabeth Warren, and at the end of the day, if we're going to defend ourselves against Tucker Carlson. Well, first, we must unequivocally state that we have no capitalism in the world today. The 2008 couldn't have been caused by capitalism because there was no capitalism. Not if capitalism means free market. If capitalism means freedom from coercion, freedom from regulations, freedom from control, freedom from the government running the economy, there was no capitalism before the financial crisis. The financial crisis could not have. We can argue about what exactly did cause the financial crisis, but it could not have been caused by free markets because it is exactly those areas that went bust, mortgages, housing, rating agencies, that are most controlled, most regulated, least capitalistic. But that we don't have capitalism at all. When you're taxing wealthy people at 37.6%, that is not capitalism. When you've got thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of regulations, that is not capitalism. When 150 Government employees, government bureaucrats, government regulators go to work every single day at J.P. Morgan, signing off on every decision one of the great American banks makes. That is not capitalism. So, over and over and over again, we have to make the case. Yeah, there are problems today. <laughs> the economy screwed up. People are being left behind. There is a lot of unfairness in the economy today. There's a lot that should be different. And the reason for the problems is not capitalism, because we don't have it. Indeed, we have to make the case that the reason for the problems is statism, government intervention, government control, that that's what caused the financial crisis, and that's what makes things worse, and that's what, to the extent that the middle class is held back, that's what's holding them back. To the extent that there are people who are struggling in America today to make a living while working full-time jobs, that's not capitalism. That's statism, which constrains our ability to raise the productivity of labor and therefore raise wages appropriately. It's, capitalism, it's, it's statism that restricts our ability to distribute capital to its most productive uses and then limits the availability of capital by taxing. It is regulations that restrict the ability of innovations and, and, and progress on a large scale, on a large scale that hold wages down. It's not capitalism. Capitalism is a system in which productivity explodes and as a consequence, wages explode with it. And you can see it. You can see it in the regulated segments of the economy versus the unregulated segments in the economy. You can see it in the, how, how productivity, how fast it goes up, how much it improves, how much changes there are in the various sectors. 
So the first case that has to be made is that capitalism, we don't have it. And that to the extent that we move towards capitalism, many of the so-called problems that exist go away. And to the extent that we move away from them, we only, only reinforce those problems. The second argument we have to make is that indeed inequality is not a problem. It's not a problem economically. There's no theory that suggests that it is. And importantly, it's not a problem morally. And here, the key point we have to make throughout all the time, nonstop, is that somebody's need is not a claim against everybody else. Somebody's need is not a claim against those who have. It's not a claim against those who are productive. Somebody's need is not, does not create a moral necessity on you to satisfy that need. We have to advocate from the position of a morality of self-interest. We cannot accept the need as a claim. Once you accept that, it's over. They win. And of course, this is why Republicans must lose, because they've accepted that need is a standard of value. Again, look at Tucker Carlson. So, we have got to stand up for the idea that morality is about your life. Morality, and this goes back to her view of morality is about kicking dogs. The view of morality is how to make your life the best life that it can be, how to make a flourishing life, how to be productive, how to create a career, how to build a successful life. That's what morality studies. That's what morality looks at. That's what being a moral person means. It means focusing on a good life for you. If we accept that morality is about how you treat other people, particularly how you sacrifice other people, how you benefit other people directly, again, we lose. And I know the altruists, what they try to do, what the, the ones who want to be pro-markets, what they try to do is they say, but look, markets are good for everybody. But they're not, not equally. Markets are good for some people more than others, and why should they be? If the needy deserve, and the needy are not getting as much as the non-needy, then that's morally offensive. It's not about wealth creation, because it's not about pursuing your own life. It's about wealth redistribution. And capitalism doesn't redistribute wealth in the way that our morality would like. It doesn't redistribute wealth equally. We have to debunk the whole idea that equality is some kind of virtue. Equality is a vice. Equality of outcome, equality of opportunity, a vices because they require the violation of some people's rights. The use of coercion and force on some in order to so-called provide opportunities to others, to provide Wealth or, or money, it's not even wealth, money to others. We have to be able to make that moral claim that inequality is a feature of freedom, not a bug. A feature of freedom, not a bug. And that when economies are free, they get rich. And when they get rich, everybody who's productive gets richer, not equally. But when economies are free, they get rich, and everybody who's, will, who's productive, standard of living goes up. And to some extent, even those who are not productive, their standard of living goes up, just because the stuff around them gets better. So, inequality is not a problem. Inequality is a feature of freedom. It's a feature of wealth creation. It's a feature of a rising tide. It's a feature of good things, good things happening under freedom. And this is where I'll also just say 
as an aside, as an economic side, that the whole idea that the middle class has stagnated, the wages have not gone up, is just bogus. It's just not true. And one illustration of that is just the idea that everybody has one of these today. And a computer. And a, all kinds of other goodies that we have. And yet economists can't measure that. They can't measure the value of these things to our lives. They can't value, value the way in this, these things have improved our lives in significant ways. All they can measure is the amount of money, in a sense, we have in the bank. But if that money is actually buying us better things, things that contribute to our life more, they don't have a measure for that. They don't have a way to calculate that. So even if, and I'm not even sure this is true, well, I know it's not true, even if, in some, by some monetary standard, people have stagnated. In terms of the quality of life, in terms of their standard of living, in terms of what they can do with that money, I would argue their lives have actually improved. Now, let me just repeat. You can get all of this in great detail and proven with charts and numbers and history and lots of data in my book with Don Watkins, Equal is Unfair which I encourage everybody to go and read because I think it really provides a big chunk of the moral answer to what is going on here. Lastly, I think that one of the crucial things that has to be done if we're gonna, if we're gonna defend capitalism and stop the tide of AOC and Elizabeth Warren, stop the tide of class warfare, stop the tide of the American people blaming all their problems on the rich. I guess we've run out of Mexicans and we've run out of Chinese because Donald Trump has fixed all that. Now we'll run after the rich. Right? But it's, notice it's the same mentality. Republicans want to blame the Chinese and the Mexicans. The Democrats want to blame the rich when it's none of those people's fault. Problems we have today are our fault. They're the fault of the people who have established the system that we have, the mixed economy that we have. It's the fault of the people who advocate for and who vote for and who, who, who enact the mixed economy. So the thing we have to do is defend billionaires. We have to show how billionaires are moral. We have to show how billionaires are productive. We have to show how billionaires create value. We have to show that they have earned every last dime that they make. Now, if there are billionaires that are truly crony, that the essential characteristic that they have is cronyism, then attack the cronyism. Attack the subsidies the government favors. Don't attack the billionaires even when they're lefties, in their capacity as billionaires, defend them. Show how you cannot become a billionaire in a free society without creating real values. Real values for hundreds of millions of people. Real values that change the world for the better. That you cannot become a billionaire without applying your mind without thinking, without working hard, without figuring stuff out that nobody else can in order to solve those values. I mean, we have to defend Bill Gates, even though sometimes he says horrible things. We have to defend Warren Buffett, who is disgusting in many ways, because he made his money honestly. He made his money by producing. He made his money by making the world a better place for all of us. You cannot be in the 1% unless you've created something, you've added something, you've made something of yourself. There's no way. Because to be in the 1% or the 0.1%, which is a lot of what this is going after, is the 0.1%. To be in the 0.1%, you've had to come up with some innovation. 
You've had to create something that people really want and are willing to pay you for more than what it costs you to produce. And not a few people. Millions and millions and millions of people. And then they're willing to pay f to buy it over and over and over again. Because every business has massive costs. You have to make a profit over and over and over again to become a billionaire. Which means you have to create great products that lots of people want because they make those people's lives better over and over and over again. And the achievement of that, the ability to shape markets, the ability to bring products to market, to bring ideas to market, to bring services to market, that reshape the world, that add value to us, that is, a, that is an amazing ability. And what a billion is. They're the people who bring that to us. They're the people who are standard of living, our quality of life depends on. Without the entrepreneurs, without the inventors, without the innovators, without the capitalists, we're all in mud huts. We're all fighting ringworms in Alabama or wherever it was. Right? All the stuff that we take for granted is stuff created by that 0.1%. So we have to defend them. We have to defend the financiers among them, the technology innovators among them, the internet entrepreneurs among them, the Walmarts of them among them. I mean, think about how Walmart has benefited the lives of millions and millions and millions and millions of Americans. And they're the villains somehow. So we have to distance the world in which we live from capitalism. One, we have to argue against the idea that inequality is a problem. Two, we have to defend billionaires. Three, and running as a thread through all of that, we have to reject the morality of altruism. Who the hell are you to take 70% of my income? What business is it of yours? How much money I make? My wealth is mine. You're going to take 3% of it? I wish. I wish I was a billionaire, right? I don't wish you could take 3%, but I wish I was a billionaire. Who are you? By what right? By what moral right? I'm a productive, honest individual. As I said in the show I did a few weeks ago about the progressive, in the, the progressive income tax, taxes should be regressive because the billionaires of the world have contributed so much already. The whole world stands on their shoulders. Now we're going to penalize them for the contribution that they've made? We should be rewarding them. So we have to reject the idea of altruism. We have to reject the idea that your life belongs to the collective. We have to reject the idea that your life belongs to the needy. We have to reject the idea that politicians own you and get to decide what you should do with your property and your wealth. And until we're willing to do that, Elizabeth Warren and AOC and their various minions and maybe a more charismatic version of them are going to win. Are going to win. Because they check all the right boxes. They've got a story about blaming capitalism. They've got a story about inequality. And they use the altruism to justify all that and more than anything they use their altruism to blame the billionaires Ay. so I mean these proposals I mean this idea think about what she's saying a society that allows billionaires is an immoral society why is she saying that? 
Because for whom morality is about the least able. For whom morality is about those with the greatest need. The standard for a healthy society is the well-being of those who are least productive. I say no. I say the standard for a moral society is the status of the most productive. Only a society that allows for billionaires to be created is a moral society. Because it means that it rewards ability. It means that it leaves individuals free to pursue their own talents, their own abilities, their own values, their own productive genius. And it rewards them based on how productive they are. So it's a just society. Indeed, capitalism is the only just society, the only just system. What she is proposing is immoral. Because it would penalize you for your ability. It would penalize you for your creativity. It would penalize you for your productiveness. It would penalize you for your virtue. The more virtuous you are, the more taxes you pay. At least when it comes to productiveness. That is deeply immoral. That is evil. And yeah, it's going to cripple. It's going to cripple the economy. It's going to misallocate resources. It's going to mean less capital investment. All of that is true. And at the end of the day, the middle class and the poor will actually be worse off, worse off under her system. Although in some European countries where they redistribute a lot, the poor are better off materially than they are in the U.S. But everybody is poorer because there's less innovation, less creativity. That's all true, but that's not the essential argument. The essential argument is what you want to do, Elizabeth Warren, is you want to penalize virtue. What you want to do is you want to penalize ability. What you want to do is you want to penalize productiveness. And as a consequence, you're going to hurt everybody. You're going to hurt me. You're going to hurt yourself. You're going to hurt the people around you. What you want to do is take away freedom. What you want to do is create an immoral society. So until we're ready to call AOC and Elizabeth Warren that they are the ones advocating for immorality, not because the poor get poorer under their system, that's also true, but because the rich get poorer under their system, because the productive get poorer under their system. So the defense needs to be a moral defense of wealth creation, a moral defense of the profit motive, a moral defense of capitalism. Not a wimpy, you know, she doesn't know numbers or she can't add or any of this nonsense. But actually attack them. You know, Americans still admire Productiveness. Americans still admire success. Americans still admire entrepreneurs. But what they've been told for the last 10 years is it's those people caused the financial crisis. Those people are holding them back. It's those people that are causing stagnation in the economy. It's those people who are now stealing money, not making it. And nobody, def nobody counters that. Nobody counters that. So they're starting to believe it. And once they really believe that, then it's over. Then the American experiment is over. The American... The value of America is over. And again, I think that we saw the beginning of that. We're seeing the beginning of that with Trump. Trade is a zero-sum game. Subsidize, control. It's us versus them. Going after Bezos, going after Amazon. It's all kind of on the right already. Tucker Carlson, it's in the, it's in already... It's in the water everybody's drinking. It's everywhere. And there are like five voices in the culture combating it on a moral basis. Yeah, somebody said the, the trade principle. Yeah. Yeah, you can't, become a, you can't become a billionaire unless you trade. And by trading, you're 
you're benefiting the people you trade with. It's win-win. The trade of principle is a win-win. All right. Let's see. Are there any super chat questions? Is Trump sure to lose in 2020? I don't know. I don't think he's sure to lose. I mean, suddenly, um, what was it? Uh, yesterday was maybe his worst day of the presidency. Um, having to back down and completely lose to Pelosi, of all people? You start a stupid fight that you can't end? You lose. And he, I mean, I think yesterday was a massive loss for Pre President Trump. I mean, he, he, he looked so weak. He looked pathetic. Um, it doesn't matter what happens from here on. You know, he is a loser, and, and there's nothing worse than somebody who's claimed that he can win. He can, he's the art of the deal. He's a negotiator. You know, the, we won't open the government unless there's a wall. We won't do something temporary. We won't have negotiations until there's a wall. Then basically say, no, I'm reversing all of that. Change my mind. I mean, that, that, was, that was something to watch. And, and the way he's trying to spin it in, in, uh, in text and stuff, that, that was so, that was an embarrassment. And whether he can recover from that, because I think that hurt him with the base. I think that really hurt him with the base. So, and, and he, he can't win without the base, not just wanting him, but enthusiastically wanting him. So, I don't know who's going to win in 2020. I don't make political predictions because I'm not good at it. You have to have a real sense of the American people and what they want, and, and I don't. I just know it's bad. <laughs> no matter who wins, it's not going to be good. Um, if you want to ask a question, by the way, I see people are trying to ask questions in the chat. Do it with the super chat, and I'll answer it. How likely will these policies turn to violence? I don't see why they would turn to violence. I just don't see the violence, right? So, so let's, say, let's say Elizabeth Warren gets elected president, God forbid. But let's say she gets elected president. And, um, and she, in the name of capitalism, wants to save capitalism by raising the marginal income tax rate or establishing a wealth tax. Who's going to go out into the street to defend billionaires? Nobody. Let's say she's going to expand Medicare for all. She's going to give us universal health care. Who's going to go out into the streets to protect? And let's assume they create a two-tiered system where you can keep, like in England, where you can keep your private medicine if you're rich or upper middle class and everybody else gets socialized medicine um, and they run up deficits of trillions of dollars. Who's going to go out into the streets? Now, ultimately, it might turn to violence when things collapse and the economy struggles and things get worse. But... I don't, I don't see where the violence is coming from. And I don't see, like, I, I could see the Trump base, or some people in Trump base, voting for Bernie Sanders, voting for an Elizabeth Warren. Because, again, I don't think that Trump's rhetoric, style, or policies are that different than Elizabeth Warren's. They're all statists. They have different emphases. I mean, maybe, I think the issues you could get violence over is immigration. Immigration is definitely, it's such a visceral issue on the right that I could see the right becoming violent if there was an attempt to loosen up restrictions on immigration and to open up immigration in a bigger way. That is something I can see real violence. And, and of course, the left is prone to violence on issues like speech, Restricting speech, they want to restrict it. Uh, gender, things like that. So the, the Antifa side of it. Um, you know, the other thing that's amazing that I never thought when I came to America this would ever happen. I mean, this is the most shocking thing to me of the last four years. The most shocking thing is the rise of explicit, unadulterated racism in America. Uh, the the alt-right to me, is shaking me to the core. I always knew the leftists existed. I always, I mean, that philosophy, that ideology has been around forever. 
for a long time. It's been dominating the universities. You could see it coming. You could kind of predict it. If you, if you saw what happened in the 60s, it's really an outgrowth of the 60s. Ayn Rand predicted this perfectly. Um, but the rise of the alt-right was not something I expected. I expected a religious right. I expected a, a more violent religious right. But, you know, and people say, oh, the alt-right is small. They're not. No, I, I think it's more substantial. People think... And I think also that there's a, they have a lot of sympathizers who might not be out in the street demonstrating. They might not be viciously anti-Semitic or viciously racist, but there's so many people who, who talk about America as a white nation. There's so many people who talk about race as if it's important and significant. There's so many people now talking about IQ and all IQ has become, all IQ has become is a pseudo-scientific disguise for racism. Um, it's why I, you know, why does Iran get so passionate about a psychological measure of intelligence? Why is he so, because of this, right? Otherwise, who cares about IQ? The only thing that, the reason I care about IQ is, is, is because it has become this, Catchword. Anybody who starts talking about IQ, you could, you know, within a few minutes, you can get what's the real issue. The real issue is I don't want those brown people, those black people coming across the border. They're low IQ people. It's not even that they want to have tests on the border and only accept the, the high IQ Mexicans or whatever. No, no. They, it's the averages of what matter. Therefore, we wipe them all out. Tells you everything you need to do. So somebody says IQ is a valid predictor of future success. Yeah, it's got, it, it explains about, uh, you know, at best about 20% of the variability of future success. You know, that's okay. It, it's a predictor, but it's only, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's still a tiny minority. It's, it's one fifth of what explains future success. It's statistically significant. I'll give it that. I know the econometrics. But whether the econometrics and the way they run them are valid, you know, I'm a skeptic because I've done too much statistics. I'm a skeptic because I know econometrics and I know what people do. And I've never looked carefully at how the psychologists do econometrics. But I suspect, and you know, I could be wrong here, but I suspect that psychologists, a lot of them, math is not their strong suit. And statistics and econometrics are not easy. They're complicated. They're hard. And... To do them right is hard. To know what you're doing carefully is hard. And unless I actually go in and research and actually look at the regressions and look at the exactly, but at best, at best, based on their models. Right? Then it's 20%. Um, but you know, Nassim, Nassim Taleb, who I can't stand, by the way, for a variety of reasons. We can do a show on Nassim Taleb sometime. But Nassim Taleb has an essay out just in the last week or so. Now, Nassim Taleb is a world-class jerk, and, and there are lots of issues with Nassim Taleb, and I think he's, he's unbelievably arrogant, and I think he's wrong on a lot of issues, particularly when you get deep into epistemology. He doesn't understand epistemology at all, and he's, a, he, he's got a lot of bad stuff, but, he's, but Nassim Taleb is a world-class statistician. Nassim Taleb is a world-class econometrician. And Nassim Taleb just came out with an essay that I have not examined carefully, and, and I, I'm, I'm not sure if it's carefully written, so I'd, I'd have, to, I have to go and... But he just came out, and you can find it, I think, on his uh, on Medium, where he posts his blogs, uh, basically saying IQ is a completely bogus measure. Now, I don't know if he's right or wrong, but Nassim Taleb is no idiot. He's no, uh, on these kind of issues. And he, and, he, and he makes the explanation on statistical econometric grounds. And it, it'll be interesting to go through that paper and actually analyze it and figure out what he's actually doing and whether there's anything true to what he says. Um, but, uh, yeah, two predictors of success, IQ and motivation. No, it's still less than 20%. So go look at the regression. Pull up the paper, Jones 227. Pull up the paper, the actual research paper. Don't li just listen to uh, Jordan Peterson. Pull up the actual research paper and look at the regression 
and tell me what the R squared is. Tell me how much of the variance it actually explains. And then we can get into discussion of whether the regression is a good regression, whether the independent variables are truly independent, how much other correlation there is between the independent variables, and whether it's measuring a proper measure of success. So all of that we can do, but you have to actually have the, the data, not just what Jordan Peterson throws out there as God-given truth, which is talking to other people who do this kind of work is just not true. Just not true. All right. Um, if there are no more Super Chat questions, I think I'm going to call it a night. I'm tired. I just flew in today from L.A. Um, and uh, I want to go see the basketball game because the uh, Boston Celtics are playing the uh, Golden State Warriors. It, it, I'm looking forward to a fantastic game. I'm not looking forward to the score because I think Golden State, unfortunately, is going to win the game. But I'm hoping for a really, really good game. Um, we will be talking more about AOC and Elizabeth Warren as their proposals come out. As I said, Elizabeth Warren has a whole slew of actual legislative proposals. Give her credit. Give this one thing, this woman, one piece of credit. I'm not going to give her credit for anything else, but I'll give her credit for this. She has actually articulated a plan. She's actually told us what, is go what she's going to do. She's actually proposing specific bills that she would want to see passed by Congress if she becomes president. So we can judge her not just on demagogy, not just on rhetoric, but on actual specific detailed proposals which she has submitted. So we'll go over some of those proposals, particularly as the election approaches, and, and the, at least the Democratic primary approaches, which I, I, can, I think are going to be fascinating. I'm looking forward to the Democratic primaries. I wish there were Republican primaries. I really, 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 really wish that somebody would challenge uh, Donald Trump. Where's Ben Shapiro when you need him? Ben, you got to challenge Donald Trump. Come on, I'd love to see you debate Donald Trump. Um, and, uh, and the same with uh, AOC. We're going to go over a variety of different proposals she makes, and I really want to get into this uh, Green New Deal because it's, it's, it's important and it's gaining steam among the Democrats and it's flawed in big ways. And then I want to discuss some of the economic theory behind a lot of uh, the economic proposals that the left is proposing. And that'll bring us to the discussion of uh, modern monetary theory. And I'm hoping to get somebody like George Selgin on the show to actually discuss it. All right. Uh, do I predict a recession in 2019? I'm predicting a recession in the next 18 months. I don't know exactly when. It'll probably be a mild recession. I don't see any forces that would bring about a, a dramatic recession, although you can't, it, it's hard to tell. I do predict uh, slower economic growth going into 2019. Uh, we're already, I think, seeing it, but I, I predict 2019 will have l slower economic growth than last year. Um, but you know, these kind of predictions are for fools. That's what the market was predicting in December, a recession sometime, but it seems to have changed its mind. Um, it's very hard to predict these kind of things. Uh, all right. Uh, Avid Film Buff, you could have asked questions today. I opened it up to the uh, Super Chats. So uh, uh, tomorrow, oh, I have to announce this. Tomorrow we'll have a show at, uh, what time are we doing the show tomorrow? I think we're going to do it at... Two one o'clock East Coast time. How about that? One o'clock East Coast time. So tomorrow, Sunday, one o'clock East Coast time. There's no football. You have no excuse. And it will be, um, it, it's going to be one of those uh, hangouts with some of the uh, Patreon supporters, people who, uh, those who support me at over $100 a month. And then uh, we're also going to, actually, this is 12 o'clock East Coast time. Okay, so let's assume it's 12 o'clock East Coast time. Tomorrow, we're going to have 12 o'clock East Coast time. Thank you, Jennifer. You're right. 12 o'clock East Coast time. Tomorrow, we're going to have a show. We're going to have the Patreon hangout and contributor topics. And I'll also take Super Chat questions. Uh, and then I promise to have soon a show where I just take Super Chat questions. As long as you use the Super Chat feature. So, uh, Avid Film Buff, you're going to have to use the Super Chat feature. If you've got lots of questions, you know, save up some money so you can use it to ask the questions. All right, everybody, have a great Saturday. I hope my Celtics win. I'm going to go watch the game and go to sleep. You guys, uh, 12 o'clock, East Coast time, tomorrow. Bye, everybody.